STS-112 ISS Assembly Flight 9A was an 11-day space shuttle mission to the International Space Station ISS flown by Space Shuttle Atlantis. Space Shuttle Atlantis was launched on the 7th of October 2002 at 1945 Coordinated Universal Time from the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Pad 39B to deliver the 28,000-pound Starboard 1 S1 truss segment to the space station. Ending a 4.5 million mile journey, Atlantis landed at 1544 Coordinated Universal Time on 18 October 2002 on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center's shuttle landing facility. During the launch, the ET bipod ramp shed a chunk of foam that caused a dent approximately 4 wide and 3 inches. Deep into the metal SRB ET attach ring near the bottom of the left SRB. Prior to the next mission, STS-113, an upper-level decision was made at NASA to continue with launches as scheduled. The launch subsequent to that was the ill-fated STS-107. Space Shuttle Atlantis had been scheduled to visit the International Space Station ISS again on STS-114 mission in March 2003. However, due to the loss of Columbia, all space shuttles, including Atlantis, were temporarily grounded. Due to rescheduling of missions, Atlantis did not fly again until STS-115 on 9 September 2006. Topic. Crew Topic. Mission payload Topic. Starboard 1, S1, truss segment The S1 truss segment, which provides structural support for the space station radiators was the main payload of STS-112 mission. Boeing Company started constructing the truss in May 1998. The work was completed in March 1999. The S-1 was moved to KSC in October 1999 for flight processing. Boeing delivered the S-1 to NASA in June 2002 for final preparations and pre-flight checks. Topic. Crew Equipment Translation Aid Atlantis also delivered the Crew Equipment Translation Aid CETA cart to the space station. The CETA cart was attached to the mobile transporter, launched on STS-110, to be used by assembly crews on later missions. Topic. Mission experiments STS-112 carried several science experiments to the space station including the Plant Generic Bioprocessing Apparatus PGBA, Commercial Generic Bioprocessing Apparatus CGBA, the Protein Crystal Growth Single Locker Thermal Enclosure System housing the Protein Crystallization Apparatus for Microgravity PCGSTESPCAM, and samples for the Zeolite Crystal Growth Furnace ZCG, experiment. Topic. Shuttle processing Launch preparations for STS-112 mission were slightly delayed due to tiny cracks found within the plumbing of Atlantis propulsion system on 17 June 2002 by an inspector. The cracks were in metal flow liners inside the main liquid hydrogen fuel lines that feed the shuttle's three main engines. Although there were no cracks in the actual fuel pipes themselves, the concern was that metal pieces from the flow liners might break off and fly into the engines. In such a worst-case scenario, the debris can potentially trigger a catastrophic engine shutdown, which in turn could lead to the loss of the crew and the shuttle.
Topic: Mission timeline. Topic: The 7th of October, flight day 1 launch. Space Shuttle Atlantis lifted off from Launch Pad 39B of the Kennedy Space Center at 19 hours 45 minutes and 51 seconds Greenwich Mean Time through mostly clear blue skies. There were no problems reported during the countdown, and the ascent conformed to the standard timeline see Space Shuttle, Mission Profile, Launch. For the first time in Space Shuttle history, a rocket cam Video camera mounted to the upper part of Atlantis' external tank returned live video of the flight to NASA flight controllers. The video was near perfect until the two solid rocket boosters were jettisoned. At that point, the exhaust from the separation motors fogged the camera lens and made the rest of the video difficult to see. Later, NASA announced that it was looking into a problem with explosive bolts that failed to fire properly during the launch. Immediately before the twin solid rocket boosters fired into life, only one set of pyrotechnics in ten explosive bolts exploded when commanded to do so. All ten nuts exploded as planned, but NASA was interested in finding out an explanation for the unexpected anomaly. Arguably the most significant event from this launch was the ET bipod ramp shedding a chunk of foam, estimated to be approximately 4. X5. X12. That broke away and hit the lower left SRBET attach ring near the integrated electronics assembly IEA box causing a dent approximately 4 wide and 3 deep into the solid metal prior to approval for the next mission the situation was analyzed and NASA decided to press ahead under the justification that the ET is safe to fly with no new concerns and no added risk of further foam strikes. This fateful decision set the stage for the STS-107 tragedy just two launches later. The CAIB report did not highlight the significance of video data from this being the first flight with the ET camera. Topic. The 8th of October, Flight Day 2 Rendezvous and Docking Preparations On Flight Day 2, the STS-112 crew settled into preparations for the next day's rendezvous and docking with the International Space Station. After the wake-up call went at 4.46 a.m. Central Daylight Saving Time, the crew began its first full day on orbit. Pilot Pamela Melroy assisted mission specialists David Wolfe and Pierce Sellers in a checkout of spacewalk suits and equipment. Commander Jeff Ashby worked with the prime robotic arm operator, mission specialist Sandy Magnus, to verify the arm's readiness. Ashby and Magnus powered up the arm for a video survey of Atlantis Payload Bay. The crew also completed the setting up of the orbiter docking system's centerline camera, extended the orbiter's spring-loaded ring that will make first contact, and checked out rendezvous tools. During the day, the STS-112 crew successfully completed three orbital maneuvering system ohms burns to boost the shuttle into the station's orbit and refine its approach path to the station. Astronaut Wolf also checked out the spatial heterodyne imager for mesospheric radicals or the Shimmer experiment sponsored by the Naval Research Lab. The Shimmer experiment uses an ultraviolet sensing camera to observe the Earth's atmosphere at 40 to 90 kilometers looking for possible ozone loss. The experiment proved a bit balky, but with help from mission control the crew worked out steps to ready the gear for observations during the mission. Topic. The 9th of October, Flight Day 3 Docking 
Space Shuttle Atlantis docked to the space station at 1517 Greenwich Mean Time to begin a week of joint operations for the STS-112 and Expedition 5 crews. With Commander Jeffrey Ashby at the controls, Atlantis docking system engaged the pressurized mating adapter 2, Destiny Laboratories forward docking port in the front of the space station as the two spacecraft sailed 245 miles above Central Asia at 5 miles per second. Crew members of Atlantis were the first visitors for the Expedition 5 station crew who arrived at the outpost the first week of June 2002. Following pressure checks, Station Science Officer Peggy Whitson asked Commander Ashby if he had brought the salsa that she had asked for. When Ashby replied that he had, Whitson said, Okay, we'll let you in. The hatches between Atlantis and the space station were opened at 1651 Greenwich Mean Time and astronaut Ashby floated into the Destiny module and immediately embraced Whitson. Mission specialist Sandra Magnus followed next, followed by the rest of Atlantis STS-112 crew members. They were greeted by the three-member station crew. After a safety briefing from the station commander cosmonaut Valerie Corzin, the combined crews split up and began preparing for a busy day of work. Astronaut Pamela Melroy, cosmonaut Valerie Corzin, and mission specialists Dave Wolf, Piers Sellers, and Fyodor Yurchikin configured the spacesuits for EVA-1. Magnus and Whitson reviewed robotic arm operations for moving the new truss segment into place. Topic: The 10th of October, Flight Day 4, Eva 1. The workday began at 3 a.m. Central Daylight Saving Time with a musical wake-up call to Atlantis crew from Mission Control, Houston. Earlier on Flight Day 4, astronauts Whitson and Magnus used the station's Canadarm2 robotic arm to grapple the S-1 truss structure, remove it from Atlantis payload bay, and move it to the starboard end the S-0 section. Four remotely operated motorized bolts locked the two truss segments together at 8.36 a.m. Central Daylight Saving Time simultaneously. Astronauts Dave Wolf and Piers Sellers prepared for the mission's first spacewalk. EVA-1 was the 44th spacewalk staged to support the space station assembly and maintenance. The two astronauts exited the Quest airlock at about 11.21 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Wolf's spacesuit had solid red stripes for identification, while Sellers donned an all-white spacesuit. As Wolf worked to accomplish to connect power, data and fluid lines between the S-0 and the S-1 trusses, Sellers, on his first spacewalk, released the locks on three folded-up radiators mounted to the S-1, allowing S-1's radiators to be oriented for optimal cooling. The spacewalking astronauts worked for 7 hours and 1 minute outside the space station, 31 minutes longer than expected due to a problem with the Canadarm2. The glitch forced Wolf to complete installation of a television camera system on the far end of the truss without the assistance of the robot arm. The only other problem of EVA-1 came near the end of the spacewalk when Wolf reported his helmet earphones appeared to be losing power. Throughout the spacewalk, astronaut Melroy offered guidance and advice to the spacewalkers and keeping them on schedule. Shuttle Commander Jeff Ashby operated the shuttle robotic arm, providing camera views for documentation. Following a tool inventory check and cleanup activities, Wolf and Sellers re-entered Quest. The airlock was re-pressurized at 5.22 p.m. Central Daylight Saving Time to end EVA-1. Topic. The 11th of October, Flight Day 5 Off-Duty and Transfers On Flight Day 5, the combined shuttle and space station crew took several hours of off-duty time. Then they began transfer operations between the vehicles and prepared for mission's second spacewalk. 
The crew moved a number of scientific experiments back and forth between the shuttle and the ISS to return completed experiments to Earth and deploy new experiments at the ISS. Transfer items included a set of liver cell tissue samples from an experiment studying the function of human liver cells in microgravity, moved from the station onto the shuttle for return to Earth, payload experiments such as Marshall Space Flight Center's protein crystal growth thermal enclosures for growing high-quality protein crystals in microgravity experiments were moved to and from the station. Seven water containers were transferred to the station. Commander Jeff Ashby initiated a nitrogen transfer process that moved about 15 pounds of the gas from Atlantis to the station by the end of the day. STS-112 spacewalkers David Wolfe and Piers Sellers, assisted by pilot Pamela Melroy, readied the EVA equipment they recharged water on the Extravehicular Mobility Unit EMU, configured their tools and prepared the Quest airlock. The crew also participated in several live media interviews. Astronauts Magnus, Wolf and Sellers discussed about EVA-1 and the first-time experiences in space with CBS Radio Network and Cable News Network CNN. Speaking to CBS News, Wolf told that manual work Piers and himself did at the end of EVA-1 to install the S-1's outboard nadir external camera got their heart rates up to over 170 per minute. The spacewalkers were not able to use the station's Canadarm2 as a result of a software glitch. Russian cosmonauts Valery Korzin, Sergei Treschev and Fyodor Yurchikin participated in several interviews with the Russian press. Shortly before sleep, the crew reviewed procedures for EVA-2. The 12th of October, Flight Day 6 EVA-2 Topic: The 13th of October, Flight Day 7. Topic: The 14th of October, Flight Day 8, Eva 3. Topic: The 15th of October, Flight Day 9. Topic: The 16th of October, Flight Day 10 undocking. Topic: The 17th of October, Flight Day 11 landing preparations. Topic: the 18th of October, Flight Day 12 landing. Topic: Spacewalks. Topic: Shuttle Cam. A camera mounted to the shuttle's external tank captured Atlantis' ascent to orbit. This was the first time such footage was recorded. However, after solid rocket booster separation, the camera was fogged with the propellant, and was rendered unusable. The camera was moved downward after STS-112. In the response to the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster STS-107, the camera was also used on all subsequent missions to capture images of the falling debris from the external tank. Topic. Wake up calls NASA began a tradition of playing music to astronauts during the Gemini program, which was first used to wake up a flight crew during Apollo 15. Each track is specially chosen, often by their families, and usually has a special meaning to an individual member of the crew, or is applicable to their daily activities. <laughs> 
Topic Media Topic See also List of human space flights List of International Space Station spacewalks List of Space Shuttle missions List of spacewalks and moonwalks 1965 to 1999 Outline of Space Science